Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, welcome to your O'Connell Gospel Chapel. What a blessed day it is. All right, Psalm 95, 1 and 2 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Father, we want to worship you today in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's please stand.
His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever you are faithful. Forever you are strong. Forever you are with us. Forever and ever. exalted the king is exalted on high i will praise him he is exalted forever exalted and i will praise his name he is the lord forever is true shall reign Rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise his name. shall reign heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name he is exalted the king is exalted on high All right. <laughs> michael you want to announce the uh for us to take our offering today Psalm 100, verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Father, we thank You for Your love, the love that You show through Jesus Christ. Father, we ask You now to bless this offering, and as always, use it for Your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Please stand for our final song. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing thy never before, O oh my soul, worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great. And your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Oh, worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise on that Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Ages four to second grade, you're dismissed for children's church. Everyone else, uh, stay here and greet each other.
10 minutes of Silas Moran and watch the radio. <laughs> What a hug. All right, let's read our bulletins together. Hey, today the youth is supposed to be coming back, so I don't know if that's going to be in the evening or what their itinerary is, but this is the day. The only uh, call I got from them is, uh, I think it was on Wednesday. They had some problems with the AC unit, but uh, they were able to get it fixed, call me, and I was able to pay for it, so... Praise the Lord. <laughs> so on Wednesday, we have um, Acts 23 at the Gray's house. And on Thursday, uh, I think it's still hope for hurting. No? Is, is it done now? Okay, don't come Thursday, okay? <laughs> and then Saturday is uh, 8 a.m. is Ben's prayer breakfast. If you want to help cook, Come at 6.30, okay? And early fellowship. Now, the month of August, August 7th, church picnic at the city park is after the second service on that particular Sunday. And then August 14th is the annual meeting, and that's after the second service, right here, right after the second service. And then uh, August 17th, which is a Wednesday, that's family night. And then August 27th, which is a Saturday, that's a VBS. It's going to only be one day this year. We're going to try that out and see how that works. And there's a sign-up sheet on the back. Uh, if there's any spots open, uh, please, if you feel led to help out or lead, uh, please do so, okay? All right. Missions. Tom DeWitt. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today's letter is from the Ruse, Tony and Renee. Uh, and it starts out, this summer has been a very privilege to spend a few weeks together as a whole family in the north woods of Minnesota. We are grateful for the fact that both Renee and I and the family are at the same area and we grow up and we get to see both of our families during this time. As we wrapped up the, the term in France, God did some great things to remind us that he is faithful and has never left us alone. Tony was able to preach last, last, his last time at the Toll International Church using Psalm 133 as the text of his message, and he was able to encourage the church that it is really something wonderful to live in the unity 
with other believers in each and every tribe, tongue, and nation. We got to hear some testimonies of people who were impacted not only by the church, but by, more importantly, by the hand of God. Stories of God speaking to them, revealing himself to them, and calling them to himself. It was a great day. Shortly after, we packed up our apartment and headed off to see Hannah graduate from the Black Forest Academy. It was such a blessing to celebrate with her what God has done and the hard work that she had done to finish her high school career and on to the honor roll as well. The next day, the three of us hopped on an early morning flight to the USA to start our home assignment for a year. Faith greeted us at the airport, and we were a family once again of four. During the year, we have a various speaking engagements, which started two weeks ago with the end of v VBS. We had fun opportunity to share God's story with the missions with the kids, and next week we will start at a, speak at a local church in northern Minnesota and then travel to Ohio in, for a training seminar that week after. It's going to be a busy couple of weeks, in fact, a couple of years. However, we see many of you this year and tell you about the great things that God is doing. The girls are both working full-time this summer to help offset the cost of college. And both have jumped in full speed into work. Uh, we are so proud of them. Back in France, Envision Team is wrapping up a week of ministry with two interns and a team. That's why we love the work with collaboration with people and teammates. Even when we are not on or we are on home assignment, the gospel continues to be proclaimed to the lives of people in France. Below is a picture of the team and the interns and the creative arts crew during the week of creative night. God is on the move. And you can see these letters. They're always in the book in the back, so you can look at the picture. Uh, and here's a note directly to O'Connell Gospel Chapel. It says, thank you so much for your prayers and financial support. Today, we start a new fiscal year, and it is because of your generous and sacrificial gifts that we are able to meet and surpass the funding goal for this year. We know that times are chaotic and financial strains are happening all for all of you. So we thank you so much again and again. Also know that God is leading and we want to follow him. So if you need to talk to us about our ongoing support, make changes, or just please just let us know. Thank you for all your prayers. We love you all. Tony, Remy, Faith, and Hannah. Thank you. Don't forget about tonight, 6 p.m. is our time of worship. I really do believe that when I talked to Lane several months ago, and we, I had this on my heart that we need to bring the body of Christ together for worship and for praise, and for prayer. And I believe it helps, not only helps, it encourages and strengthens us to do it. So make sure, come 6 o'clock, and uh, we'll be able to praise God together and pray together as we should. Well, we're starting a new series on the study of 1 John. So you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 John. It's way at the end of the, book, uh, of the Bible. Uh, you have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation. So it's right at the end. And so we're going to be talking about assurance of salvation. How you know that you know that you know the Lord. Do you have that confidence today? Well, we're going to read one verse, and I'd like you to stand for it. Stand in respect to the Word of God. Verse 13, and here is the key verse to the entire book, because this is what John says, I write these things to you who believe 
in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That was for John's people and for you. God wants you to know that you know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know, to know do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Because that's where I find oftentimes that we kind of are off balance when we don't have that firm foundation. And that's what God wants us to have as we go through the book of 1 John. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we come together. And why we come together, Father, is in our worship, but also for heaven to open up, to open our eyes, to open our ears, our mind, but also open our lives up so that we may change and become more like your son, Jesus, and help us to have that full assurance of knowing that we belong to you so that we can say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, as I said, we're going through First John. We're going to talk about uh, knowing the Lord. How do you know that you know the Lord? Think about that for a moment. How do you know that you know the Lord? And, and, and I think that is a, a, a question that we all need to answer. Uh, every believer in this room here today needs to know that they know the Lord so they can serve the Lord properly. I believe if you're bouncing around and you're, whether you're saved or not, sometimes you're in, sometimes you're out, sometimes you're the, you don't know if you're the missionary or the mission field. There are things in our lives that we kind of say, do I really know Jesus? Am I truly born again? And John will answer those questions for us because you can't serve the Lord without knowing the Lord. Just can't. You, you know, we doubt at times, of course, of different things, maybe in salvation. But if you're constantly doubting, how can you serve God? If you're constantly wondering if you belong to him, you're stuck. And I believe that at times we can look at the internet and really get in trouble. I'm talking about the, theological trouble. Because we always hear something new and something, oh, you should do this, you should read this, buy this book, buy that book. And the fact is, you say, okay, when you read, you say, oh, I'm all confused now. That's not from God, that's from the pit of hell. You're not to be confused, you're to know the B-I-B-L-E, for that's the book for? Yeah. You got to know it from here. That's why we preach it. That's why we teach it. That's why we have a small groups. We want to learn more about who God is. And you see, God is the only one who can give you that confidence and that for sure foundation through the Holy Spirit that lives within you. See, when you were born again, the Spirit of God came in, convicted you of sins because you were dead to sin. You were rock dead. You you're just had no responsiveness until God came in and restored you and brought you to himself. He did that. You know, I found a quote from uh, Dr. Jeremiah on this assurance. And I think it's pretty good. He's always good anyway if you listen to him. As Christians, we've been given a genuine deed to heaven. The promise of eternal life. An inheritance and a mansion that will never be foreclosed on. Our ownership in Christ is documented in the Word of God, and our names are registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name there? But many Christians, he says, fears that a thief, the devil, is going to rob them of their title deed. They have little assurance of ownership. You know, I was reading uh, some of the uh, stats from, from this one uh, person who, uh, if I can remember his name, but anyway, I read it, and he was saying that 20% of Christians believe that this word is the very word of God. 20%. They believe this is the errant word of God. This is where you're coming with all this progressive Christianity. You know, people say, well, we got to conform. The Bible has to conform to our culture because we're not in the first century more. We're in the 21st century more. So now we have to conform the Bible to what our culture says. What do we say to that? 
That's one. No. <laughs> good. I like a little bit more protest. That's a good thing. <laughs> Protesting for the right things. <laughs> you see, and, and when we think of it, we need to have that assurance. This is why, I, why God led me to this book, for us to know that we know the Lord. Us to know that we know that we are saved, that we are going and having eternal life. You know, I found a song from Fanny Crosby. How many remember? Well, we never saw her. It was the 1800s. But you know what's interesting about Fanny Crosby? She wrote this hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You know what? When I sang that by myself, so no one was there to hear me, I, I sang that song. I said, how did she have that assurance? She knew that she knew that she knew the Lord. Amen. You can't write something like that without having that kind of knowledge. The other ones that she has written, Blessed Redeemer, Jesus is mine. How did she do that? She knew that she knew the Lord. She says, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. How does she do it? She knew that she knew the Lord all the way my Savior leads me. How did she know? She had confidence that she knew the Lord and she knew that this life was short and the next life, she says, the first person I'm going to ever see is the face of Jesus. God. Yeah. So that's the theme. And we're going to run through this whole book, five chapters, and we're going to try to be faithful to every... We're going to be faithful to the text, but it may take a while. So buckle your seatbelts. Be ready to go. We're going to be moving along, not at a fast pace, maybe even like a snail pace at times. But we need to get into why the book was written, so we've got to go into introduction. We have to understand John and why he wrote it. Well, first off, John was, uh, wrote this letter, and if you look at 1 John, you don't see his name. So how do they know that it was John? This is how they know. The early church, not the first service, but the early church in the beginning, they read these documents, the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and, and the names weren't there, and they said this was Brother John. This was he, he was the one. And let, you need to understand that he was the last living connection with the apostles. And he wrote this book, this letter, poem, however you want to look at it, in his 90s. He was serving the Lord in his 90s, writing this book to this church. Because when you see it, he was an overseer of the churches in Ephesus. Now think about the 90s, when you're 90. Now I look at Earl, and I said, Hi, he's, you're 89, right? You're going to make 90 next year. I know you are. Uh, I shouldn't be prophetic. <laughs> but you know what? And I said this first service, and I don't mean to miss anybody else in here. But at 89 years old, he's still teaching the Word of God on Wednesday mornings. At 89 years old, he's still going to the jail to preach the gospel. At 89 years old, he is able to work with children in Awana. He helps out with, uh, with BBS, with family night. He's 89! Praise God. You don't retire from the work of God. Amen. Some of you need a little fire under your Say, where, God, where do you want to use me? Because he wants to use you, but you see, you're not going to be useful unless you know that you know you're saved or you're born again. And so we see that he was an overseer in Ephesus, and Ephesus is in Asia Minor, or would you, I would say uh, modern-day Turkey. And a little-known fact about John, and this is interesting, that John was known to be carried into all the churches he went to. Why? He couldn't walk. He didn't have a wheelchair. So his disciples would pick him up, and they would carry him to churches. And when they found out that this apostle, the last apostle, was coming, he would, he would fill the churches up with people because they wanted to see John. 
It would be just like for our church if Franklin Graham talked to me and said, Hey, Pastor Pete, and I said, who is this? Franklin Graham. Oh, really? Uh, this ain't a prank, is it? No. So he would talk to me and say, You know what I want to do is I want to come to your church and I want to preach the gospel. I'll say, Yeah, but you know what? We'd have to go to the stadium in Ocanto Field. See, that's how excited the people were. They, they'd be pouring in to hear Franklin. They'd be pouring in to hear what he has to say because he's the son of Billy Graham. And so the same thing happened with, with John the Apostle. When he came to these churches, he was filling them up. Now, what would he preach? This is documented. This is how he preached. Little children love one another. I say to you, little children, love one another. That's what John did. That's what he preached. He wrote the letter, but when he would go to churches, he would just reinforce the fact, love each other. Because if you love each other, you know Jesus, you know God. So he said, love one another. That's important. Now, when you think about John, and you think about his life, you know, when we go on into early part of Mark, remember when we talked about when Jesus found Andrew and Peter, John and, and, James, or, uh, John and James? And you remember when Jesus saw Andrew and Peter, he says, follow me, and what did they do? They dropped everything and went a little ways down on the shoreline. There was James and John. He said, follow me. They left their nets, left their father Zebedee, and followed him. Now it's interesting, these guys had a nickname. Jesus gave them this nickname. Look with me to Mark chapter 3, verse 16. Now, this is the Lord appointing the 12 apostles. And we'll just start at the beginning. Jesus went up, verse 13, on the mountainside and called to him those he, who he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them as apostles, that they might be with him and might send them out to preach. And he gave authority to drive out demons. So here we got in 16. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he called the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, his brother John, to them he gave the name Sons of Thunder. Why? This is why, why, he, asked, why he gave them that name. And when you think about it, Sons of Thunder... A good friend of mine, Galen Stone, he was uh, born again. He, I went to school with him, but he was in a motorcycle game called, before he came to Christ, Sons of Thunder. They were a gang, pretty rough gang. Then we find that here with John, here is Jesus saying, you're Sons of Thunder. Why would he even say that? This is why he said it, because there are two things that we could see from this. Is that they were called sons of thunder because they had a lot of energy and zeal. Oh, when you're young, you just want to drive it home. But another thing about John was this. They're, they had the tendency of having no tolerance whatsoever. That comes with youth. Sometimes we don't tolerate people. So there's an example of this. Found in Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 55. So turn there with me. Luke 9, and that's just really interesting when you think about that tendency to be not tolerating anybody else. You know, they, they thought they were doing good, but you see what Jesus says to them. It's Luke 9, 51. Through 55. But as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, remember his face was always facing Jerusalem. 
It says that for the joy set before him, he took up the cross. He, his focus always was on Jerusalem. And so we see Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's what he did. Always going there. That's the goal. That's the plan that the Father sent him. You're going to minister. You're going to heal people. Where people are going to know who I am because of you. But you're going to the cross. And he took it gladly. Verse 52. And he sent the messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. You know, Jews just don't go there. And notice what happened. But the people did not welcome them. They hated him. Because he was heading for Jerusalem. They knew he was a Jew. They don't go to Jerusalem. But Jesus is going right there. See, he went right to the people that needed to hear it. And the Samaritans needed to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, now catch this. You could see that zeal, but you could see that intolerance that they have. Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Wow. They were really bold. They were ready just to set the whole place on fire. You don't want Jesus? Well, we don't want you. Poof. Now notice what Jesus did. Now could you imagine this? Jesus turns to them and says, and he rebukes them. See, that's not the way we're supposed to do this, is hate the people that disagree with us, but to love the people who disagree with us. And so what happened? They didn't leave Samaria. Samaria. They went, continued on to another city. So you see this about John. And if you remember as you go through the book of John, what do we find there? The disciple who loved Jesus. What happened? Here you got the sons of thunder, intolerant, calling down fire like Al-Qaeda. You know, boom, you're done. Jesus says, no, we don't do it that way. What took place where John could say, I am the disciple who Jesus loved. He gave himself that own title. We should give ourselves that title too. I am the one that Jesus loves. Can you say that? I am the one that Jesus loves. Let's, I want to hear it loudly. I am the one who Jesus loves. Wow. I think that is awesome because he does love us. Now what happened to him? Remember, I find out when I was young in pastoring, I kind of a little bit stiff, you know, I mean, very opinionated. I am sometimes, but opinionated. And boy, I just drive the point home. You don't get it? Well, then you just don't get it. Then I'm done. But God started changing me. How did he change me? as I came to know Jesus more. How do you think John went from the son of thunder to the apostle that Jesus loved? And see, any time you spend time with Jesus, any time Jesus and you are together, and he's teaching himself about himself to you, and you take in that love, That will change anybody. That changed John. That will change you. The love of God will change you into becoming more like Christ. I read in one uh, commentary on the gifts of spirit, for the gift of spirit is love. That's the first one. And the more we're filled with that spirit, we surrender, the more we love each other. That's what God wants. Little children love one another. And so we see that. And John is speaking this way because he knows that God can change lives. But now we have to wonder, okay, we we find a little bit about John. There's so much more you could read. Just in your Bibles, your study Bible, you have a, a when it was written and why it was written. Read those because you get background. And so 
there's a tone to this letter. There's two things that we can that we can credit the tone for. That it was a pastoral tone where John was teaching his flock through this letter. But the other tone is a tender tone letter. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, your assignment is to find the 13 times he used Father in this book. That's a lot. He wanted them to know, I'm your dad, I'm your father in the faith. 13 times he said that. But then he also said, children are little children. So he got this daddy, this father with these little children. And then we find six more times he uses another word. Beloved. Yeah, I like that. When a group is called my beloved. I, I've never done that. But J. Vernon McGee did it all the time before he, how he addressed his audience, his radio. Beloved, let's turn to, and he meant it. Could you imagine? Maybe I need to do that more to say, beloved, God has a word for you today. Because he loves you. And he calls me to give it to you. Because I know that when we understand who he is, and we understand the love he has for us, the light that he brings us, we'll have that steadiness in our walk with God, and we will be able to do whatever God wants us to do with confidence. Amen. But you've got to know what this all means and find those things in the Scripture. So I'd ask you, find that, those words, Father, children, beloved. Yeah, it's so important. So as a father teaching the basic truths of the Christian life to his children. That's the tone. Dads, granddads, don't miss the opportunity to teach your children the Word of God. Take the time to try to help them to understand what this says. You see, that's, I find this out as a grandpa now. Uh, and, you know, we get to see Rowan maybe once or twice a month. He loves to read. He's always giving books and sit in our lap. And, but he wants to read what he wants to read or have me read. So he'll go through the book and everything. Well, the, the last time we were there, uh, Shea brought out the Bible that they read to him. And you know, when you read that Bible, that children's Bible to your sons and daughters, they will start getting firm conviction that they need Jesus and they will walk in the faith and they will grow up as you consistently work with them. They'll walk with the Lord and have assurance of their life to work with Jesus that they'll be those kind of children that says, I follow Jesus because my daddy and my grandpa has helped me. You know, the story of Fanny Crosby. She was uh, born with an eye condition. So they had a quack. And they didn't know he was a quack at the time. But he came and put some medication on it. And instead of solving the problem, it worsened the problem. She became blind as a baby. Well, during this period of time, she lost her daddy. He died. And his mother was 21 years of age, and she had to go to work. And so she handed her off to Eunice, her mom, her grandma, to say, here she is, i got to work. And what their goal was, what her goal was, Eunice's goal was, is that she would look at everything around her, and she would try to describe what she saw to Fanny. She was absorbing that. But you know what the greatest thing was? This grandmother did, and grandmother's here today. She took time, specifically every day, to read the Bible to her and explain the things of God to her. And also during this time, as she was getting to her teens, she memorized all four Gospels. She memorized Proverbs. 
There's a few others, but just think of it. Being blind, memorizing four Gospels. Why do you think she could write, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. She knew that. She was taught that. Grandmas, grandpas, teach your children the Word of God. Don't let the world teach them, because they'll teach them another kind of doctrine with me, 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 me. Don't let the world teach your children. Whether it's a grandma or grandpa, or a mom or dad, you got to teach your kids. What does it mean to know the Lord? And so when we see that, we have to ask ourselves, we know the tone of the letter, he, like a pastor speaking to his church, as a father with a tone, tender tone, about his children, little children, beloved. Uh, we see that. But why did he write this book? You'll notice that there were those coming inside and outside from the church causing disruption. There was heresy coming in, and it still comes in the church today in the form of progressivism. Remember when I said only 20% believe that this is the actual Word of God and saying it needs to conform to our culture, not us to, you know, the Word of God to us to change us. So these heretics were entering the church. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Paul is addressing the Ephesus church. Acts chapter 20. Twenty-eight through thirty. So now all these people, all these heretics, are infiltrating the church. And there's a lot of churches that he is charged over, and they're being hit. And Paul spoke of this early on, or later on in his letter or the book of Acts. Look at verse twenty-eight. Here is what he says to the elders. And this is what I say to our elders, and I'm the head elder, and we have elders, and I'm saying this to our elders here today. Keep watch over yourselves. Yes, watch your heart. Watch your heart to make sure you don't become deceived. Know the Word of God. But then it says, and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, watch over them. So our responsibility is watch over the flock. But then he says here, and the Holy Spirit has done this, has given those elders, this is your job, shepherd the sheep. Then he says, be shepherds of the church of God. Why? Because he bought them with with his blood. There's power in the blood. He bought all of you. If you're born again by the Spirit of God, he bought you with his blood. He bought you with it. You're his. And we're responsible for that. Elders, leaders, it's not about us. It's not about what what you should do because we said it. No, we need to shepherd the flock Because they are blood-bought. Now, he leads us up to verse 29. He says, I know that after I leave, this is Paul, after he leaves Ephesus, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. That's the first thing. They're coming from the outside in, and they are going to tear you to pieces. They're going to throw all kinds of False doctrine your way. And you know what Satan likes to do? He likes to bring confusion, not peace. But notice what else it says. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So you don't only just have it coming from the outside. They're rising up from the inside because I have a better word for you. Follow me. I have special revelation from God. Where do we get that? 
You know what I thought was really disturbing? Please don't take me political here, but this is what disturbed me about the church. Everybody had a prophecy about Trump. Everybody. I saw this. I saw that. This is what's going to happen. Well, you know, the trumpets, it, well, what's Trump's name? Trump. It has to be. The... Stop watching that. That's garbage. Little children love one another. And so we see that, that as we look at that, Paul says that that's what's going to happen. So here is John writing to his flock, teaching them about something that's happening around them in their churches. He says there are heretics coming into our church. Which heretics are they? Have you ever heard of the Gnostics? G-O-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. Who were they? Well, to simply put, I have a word that you don't have. You don't see it in the Bible. It's mine. God told me this. Always be careful when someone tells you, God told me this, and you need... Only way I could say God told me this, I better read the Word of God to you. Amen. So these Gnostics... What did they do? They emphasized personal, spiritual truth, knowledge. The brainiacs, you know, the all, all know-it-alls. And forso- forsaken the orthodox tradition of faith from the Word of God. This is who John had to contend with. And what was their problem? Well, it was the nature of Christ, the Christ. Oh my goodness, that hasn't changed. Because even within that survey, there are many who don't believe that Jesus is divine. We have a strange world we live in. So these Gnostics, these know-it-alls, were infiltrating the church from the outside and coming up from the inside. Always be careful when they say, well, I have a word. I read this on the blog, and this, is, this must be truth. You read it and say, that's not even fitting with the word of God. Oh, no, no, no. He, he's a holy man. He knows what... No, no. You say, now, I want you to know that if you don't know this book, if you don't know what it says, you'll say, oh, really? By his book. Oh, you'll be... Oh, you're, you have deep revelations of God. Go buy the book! You can just throw it away because you're going to pay maybe 1995 for his knowledge. Don't do it. I'm not saying not to read books. I'm just saying be careful of people who talk about it as if they have something you don't have. And that's what was happening in, in the churches when Paul was there and, and, and John. So these Gnostics had a problem about the personality of Christ. What they denied was that Jesus was the Christ. What does that mean? Well, if we go back to our text, John chapter 2, 1 John, verse 22. Now, now John is real strong here. He says this, Who is the liar? Question mark. The liar is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is an antichrist. They deny that he is the Christ. You know what's happening? It's 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 it was it's kind of like a snowball. They say, well, Jesus was a Christ, not the Christ. Buddha has the Christ. Muhammad has the Christ. All these Eastern religions, they have the Christ. They have a knowledge. 
And we, it all comes together. I think they call it syncretism. They bring it all together and say, that's why we say, we are the world. Hmm. <laughs> that's an old one. But, <laughs> but they're still doing it. How do you think it's all going to become one world religion? Because all these people have denied Jesus the Christ. And now we're saying, oh, we all have the Christ. I'm the Christ. You're the Christ. Only way you're going to get deceived by that is you don't know your Bibles. And you don't hear sound biblical doctrine. But also we see that they denied that he was incarnate. The word incarnate means Jesus, the eternal word of God, appeared in human flesh. That's the whole first part of John chapter 1. And what you're going to know in this book of John, you see parallels of Gospel of John to John, 1 John. Notice this. When you read the Gospel of John, John is introducing you to Jesus. In 1 John, he says, I introduced you to him. Now you can become his friends. You can know me. You can know him. And so they were denying that he was the Christ, but they also denied the incarnate so if you turn to John chapter 4, 2 and 3. Now John is very certain and points this out to this church that's struggling. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. We all want to do that, right? We all want to recognize the Spirit of God, right? Right? John says, yeah, this is how you're going to do it. Well, it applies to their situation. And he says this, Every spirit that acknowledges that Christ Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. These cults do not believe that Jesus came in the flesh. That's when another doctrine that came out, Ferris, uh, uh, heresy. We had the Gnostics, I think it was a form of it, is Doceticism, which means that he was, he was human, but... He didn't have the Christ or anything. He did when he, when he got on the tree or on the cross. Then he died. He had the Christ and it left him. So they kind of di they divorce all that. It's invisible. That's what it was. It's invisible. He, I mean, that he was there. He's not really there. But that's what the Muslims believe. They don't believe that Jesus actually died on the cross. They believe that it was an a image or a projection of the spiritual Christ. And people eat that up. Why do people eat these things up? Because they're always looking for a fresh new word. I'm really tired of hearing that same story from the Bible. I'm tired of hearing word for word, that expositional preaching. I'm tired of that. I need to hear something new. So you get home, get on your, your laptops or your iPad, and you start looking, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. But because you don't know the Bible, you just suck it up. My friends, my beloved, our little children, I include myself in that, know the Word of God. Know what God has to say, that, to know that you know that you're born again. So we see in this church, what they were doing is denying Jesus' humanity and his spiritual so this is what we find in the Bible, that Jesus was human and divine, right? We know that. And he'll be, but see, he wasn't 50% human and 50% spiritual. He was 100% human without sin and 100% divine like God. And it all came together in Jesus, the Christ. And that's what you have to drive home. Because he is all human without sin. He knows your every weakness. He knows what you're going through. He can understand what you're going through because he's the, he is human, 100%. He understands. That's why he can grieve with you, weep with you, be able to help you. But because he's human, he understands that. And he is divine because he is God. Don't 
you can't take those away from them. That's the main thing. What these Gnostics were trying to do, they were trying to diminish who Jesus Christ is. And you know, any place, any religion that takes uh, Jesus as their main emphasis and puts someone else in there, we're in trouble. That's what the Mormons did. When we got there, I remember it was around, well, it was our first year, and uh, it was December 23rd, and some of those folks that used to be Mormons, but aren't, they taught me, told me, told me something. They said, you know, Joseph Smith was born before Jesus. I says, oh, really? You know, kind of weird, really, honestly. And then you go and pick up there the Book of Mormon, and I remember we had a guy in our church that was a brand new Christian, and we were going through some of the things, um, and he opened up his Book of Mormon that he had. And it says, yes, the King James is good until it's not. That's why we have the Book of Mormon. See, a lot of people think, oh, the Mormons are just good Christians. No, no, they are deceived people. They are very good people. I mean, my goodness, they, are, they do a lot. I saw that at the homeless shelter I worked at, or preached at. I saw how the Mormon church would do a lot of things for people. Just because they do a lot of good things doesn't mean they're Christian. So where Jesus is missing in the title of their beliefs, and they have someone else above that, run. Maybe even burn it. So you can understand why these little children are very confused because they're being attacked and they're wondering, am I really saved? Well, I want to point something to you. I don't know if I can make it through all of it, but we'll make it through some of it. You know, when, a, when, a, when an author of a book like Paul or Peter or John or the Gospels, they usually focus on a phrase or a word. And when you look like at 1 John, the word know, K-N-O-W, in five chapters it's used 40 times. What do you think John wants you to do? He wants you to know. And so, if you have your Bibles, I'm not going to do all 40. I couldn't get through them all, but we will do it in our study. Would you open your Bibles, and if you do write it in, please do. If not, if, it's, if you don't do it, some people just don't do that. Then take a piece of paper out and write out these verses. So, we see that John wants them to know confidently that they are born again. And there are some evidences that happen that when those who are born again, these are the things that should have should materialize. Chapter 2, verse 3. I mean, chapter 2, verse 3, yes. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. Say you're a believer. Are you in obedience to him? I, I'm not saying that you don't, we don't fail and sin at times, but it's not a consistent sinning. But if you say you know him, you're going to be obedient to him. Look at another one, verse 4. I know, I know him, but does not know. The man who says I know him, but does not know what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Wow, he is really firm with that, isn't he? He's, he say, if you don't know that, you're a liar. Boy, I tell you, that's strong language, but remember what he's fighting. Notice in verse uh, 11, go there with me. It says here, But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks around in the darkness. Now here it is in the negative. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. See, he does not know. So if you're hating your brother, you're in darkness and you're not... You, you don't know where you're going. You're just in darkness. You're hating. Let's look at another one. Verse 13 at the end, it says, I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. 
K-N-O-W-N. You have known the Father. It's possible to know the Father. That's what he says. Then in verse 14, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. To know, to know, to know. That's important when we see it in John. Let's look at another one here. Hopefully, you're, if you don't write them, I can get them to you later. Uh, Dear children, this is the last hour, verse 18. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. See, they had Antichrist going on all the time, like we do, uh, those who are against Christ, but there is going to be the main Antichrist. So be lookful. Don't, you know, don't look at the... Oh, there's people that just prophesy, and in my thinking, uh, no, the word already says it. Be careful what you hear. Let's look at another one. Verse 20. But you have the anointing from the Holy Spirit, the Holy One. So all of us have an anointing. And all of you know the truth. Hmm. All of you know, known the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know and it and and it no it and because no lie is in the truth. You see what John is saying? Do you know the truth? There's so many more here. What I want you to do when you get home is look them up. Try to find them and see what they are, and you're going to learn a lot about what you're supposed to know. But also what I want you to do is to take that piece of paper that's in your bulletin, and this is just a guide, but look them up and see where you are with these things. Now, there, there may be some shortcomings, and we've confessed those sins, but you, if you want to know if you're in the faith, it's not because you have this good, warm feeling that you feel, and you're, you're all, man, you're all awesome. Things are just great. I'm born again. And really, actually, you're just emotional. I believe emotion comes after you're born again. Now, you may disagree with me. That, that's okay. We, have, we don't have more time for me to disagree with you or you with me. But... <coughs> This is my Bible, where I get the Word of God, the truth of God, and His Word to me and to you. Remember, what He wants you to know is to know Him. He wants you to know the Word of God so that you can grow in your faith and have that assurance. Let's pray. Oh, dear Lord, Father God, I just pray right now for us as a church, we as your children, you called us to love one another, you call us to know the truth, not somebody else's truth that they say is good, but your truth which comes from the word of God. Help us to be students of the word, in Jesus' name, amen.